It's nine minutes past two, and right now we're looking at an in- initiative that is uh, that that is uh, that exists that has been launched, and we're chatting to the founder, Dr. Olua Toyin Badajogbin, and he is from the African Legal Information Institute. They seek to uh, promote free access to law and also open justice across the continent. So he's a solicitor and an advocate of the Supreme Court of Nigeria. And um, he's also become a senior international fellow in philanthropy at the John Hopkins uh, University. And he's worked quite closely. He's a research student at the University of Cape Town. But his interests, of course, have to do with advancing free access to law and justice across the continent. So how do we go about doing this? What sort of institutions exist as far as encouraging access to law um, and a system of open justice are concerned? Um, good afternoon, Toyin. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. Good afternoon. Now, uh, um, I'd just like to correct that impression, though. Um, yes. I am not the founder of um, um, the African I Legal see. Information Institute. Uh-huh. I just work as a uh, policy and advocacy lead. I see as part of uh, the the, the African Legal Information Institute. Thank you for that. That's right. Thank you. So let's look at open justice. Let's start there. We'll get to access to law in a short while. But the fact that um, open justice is all about openness, it's about transparency. Um, In the past, what has characterized the justice system in in Africa across different African countries historically? Well, I think it's, it's, it's very, very important. Um, if you want the kind of um, open societies that we advocate for in Africa, um, the kind of open societies that um, uh, respect the rights of individuals, private citizens, mm-hmm. um, affirm those rights, it, it's very important that people are able to access information um, because it, it, it's at the very, very core of everything. It's, it's a leverage right that empowers um, private citizens to be able to uh, participate meaningfully in the process of governance and to hold their um, uh, political representatives accountable. Mm. And what we've had in times past actually has been a severe limitation on the right to access information. And as I said, accessing, accessing information is extremely important to promoting open and transparent societies. Mm. So what, what that has done to uh, private citizens is actually to disenfranchise them um, to rob them of the essential implements, the essential tools that they need to be able to interact with their political representatives, participate meaningfully in um, public decisions that affect their daily lives, that impact their rights in a very, very meaningful way. Mm. So I would say in response to that, that question, that um, in, in the past, that it's still a problem that we um, experience today, that uh, the degree to which people are able to access information but speak meaningfully in public governance hold their representatives accountable has been severely limited and perhaps you can i think you can see that um in the in in, in what has been going on in the access to freedom of access to information movement across yeah. across our, our region so the two uh, go hand in hand. And what about the role of, of a free press? Uh, because we do rely on uh, journalists, we rely on, on publications and newspapers uh, to give accounts of what is going on. So is there a relationship there as well? Well, certainly there is a relationship um, because the press brings information across to people mm. that they do in fact need to be able to um, participate, um, assert their rights enforce them and hold public officials accountable. Um, so the, the press plays a very, very important role. I think without the press, um, in a, in a, to a significant degree, uh, we wouldn't have um, the, the degree of openness that we hope to see yeah. uh, in how government agencies perform, um, conduct uh, government, government business. Mm-hmm. So the press is very, very important. Um, but that's one, one side of, of, of the debate. That's one side of the coin. Um, Beyond the press, it's also very important that people, individuals, are able to access information directly. And that precisely is what uh, one of the things that, that free, up, free access to information, to law, to legal information promotes. Yes, but that suggests a change in culture. It suggests that this needs to be something that is consciously implemented uh, with those objectives in mind. Absolutely. I, I think that um, the, the culture within um, public service agencies and has been to... Um, withhold information or to shield individuals, private citizens for, from information that they, they, they naturally, I mean, they necessarily need. Mm-hmm. Um, perhaps, it's, it, or perhaps it's just a mentality um, um, that, that lack of awareness 
not just on the part of citizens, but also on the part of public officials that they occupy positions of responsibility that actually demanded they make information available to private individuals. Yes. Um, so, but the, the, it also needs to be done or administered impartially, the, the justice that is. It needs to be seen to be administered impartially. So the, the, the notion of uh, open justice helps to foster this further. So when I talked about the media earlier and the press and so on, uh, that that also is, is important, but there, there are other factors that need to be balanced against the need for open justice. So it cannot be that... Uh, uh, certain measures aren't put in place in order to protect individuals, their identities, and so on. So uh, how do we balance those out? And what are the moves afoot on the continent as far as uh, entrenching open justice and balancing it against the interests of, of others? Well, I, I, the press. The press is a very, very important um, um, component or element in the equation, if I may put it that way. Mm. Um, like I said, they play a very, very important role. Um, the press itself is an institution, and, and, and accessing government institutions um, demands some considerable level of organization which the press brings into play. Yeah. Um, but like I said, it's also important. Um, and, and again, the press plays a very, very important role in, in bringing this about. It's important that private individuals are able to access, approach government institutions, approach public officials, approach mm-hmm. the political representatives. Um, to access information, to engage with them, interact with them on issues that affect daily lives. Mm. Now, the press facilitates that in a very, very important sense. And so what we really want to see are synergies between the press you know, and private individuals. But there's so much that the press can do. Um, it's, it's important, and I think you have, you have hinted at that, that it's something that has to be very, very consciously um, cultivated. It's important that private individuals um, approach are able to access public institutions, engage with public institutions towards realizing their rights, towards like accessing public services sure. and enforcing um, what, what is rightfully theirs. Of mm-hmm. course, holding government agencies to, obligation, I mean, to, to their um, obligations as well. Now, in terms of uh, what's been going on regionally, um, there's been a wide free access to information movement across, across the region. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, it's been slow, um, but we have a few countries that have adopted freedom of, freedom of information uh, bills. Um, and that process has taken quite a um, considerable level of organization as part of civil society. Now, in terms of open, pursuing open justice, pursuing, um, and, and I think the whole concept of open justice demands that uh, you not only see that justice is done, but that it is manifestly done. Yes. Um, and, and essentially what that means is that uh, individuals observing the judicial process should be able to, should be able to work with a conviction that indeed justice is done as, as cases come before mm. our court. And what that demands is a, a, a high level of transparency on the part of judicial agencies, uh, courts, judicial administrators, and all that, you know, the, 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 the agencies that work within the entire justice setting, uh, system. So um, it's important to, uh, to be able to, uh, it, it's important to the whole concept of uh, public transparency. And I think... Judicial transparency is a very, very important component of that. Yes, yes. That uh, courts are seen to be able to are seen to be to be to be to be to be enforcing, mm-hmm. uh, judging cases appropriately, rightly, and a very, very important aspect to doing that to be able to subject uh, judicial decisions to, to 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 constructive public scrutiny is when individuals are able to access. Um, court exactly. records, yeah, yeah. Uh, review judgments of courts, make statements on the judgments of courts. Mm. And what free access to law seeks to do is to promote such access um, to, to legal information, to legal judicial decisions. Um, but free access does more than that. Um, free access also looks at the ability of uh, private citizens and, and corporate entities to access other forms of legal information, for instance, legislation. And this is a very, very important aspect of, of what we do. Mm-hmm. And what we have, from experience, what we have seen is that um, a lot of the time, even public agencies that purport to exercise functions on the one legislation or the other do not always have the guidance of this legislation to work with. Yes. So now, in a sense, the whole process of providing public services sometimes becomes a bit capricious, depending mm-hmm. on the whims and caprices of, of public officials. Mm-hmm. Essentially because they also have challenges accessing legal information. 
Yes, hence the question of change in culture uh, a little bit earlier on. But uh, South Africa was seen to have really set the pace when it came to to open justice. I mean, since the Oscar Pistorius trial, we're seeing even more cameras in our courts room, in our courtrooms rather, citizens being able to watch the judicial process unfold. Um, where have you been able to to zone in on different countries? Have you been able to make an assessment on different countries on the continent? Because uh, um, a, a drive to transform and to in, to, to to introduce um, open justice needs to be seen in in the context of each country and what their challenges are. That's absolutely correct. Um, now, uh, what we have been doing in the past um, couple of years. Um, is to see how we can, in discussions and through forums that bring different justice sector stakeholders together yes. across different parts of the region and bring them together in a forum where they can discuss their, the, the challenges to access and legal information within uh, the, in the different countries across across the region. Mm-hmm. So, so between last year and this year, we've held a couple of workshops called Open Law. Africa workshop. It, it, it's, a, it's a series of workshops that um, spotlights the challenges and the opportunities to free access to law within the African region. And um, in about five months from now, we're going to be having um, a similar workshop in South Africa, focusing on South Africa, but also involving countries from within the Southern Africa region. Mm-hmm. And, and the goal of this is to expand, to extend the frontier of free access to law in Africa, because we realize that it's, it's, it's extremely important to our developmental objectives, to a democratic um, experiment in the continent, that individuals are able to access information, to be able to participate meaningfully in governance and participate meaningfully in economic opportunities that are actually abound in the, in the region. So we look at these issues, and we, we look at these issues within the context of the kind, the unique challenges that each region confronts in terms of access to, to law. And we bring stakeholders from individual countries together who discuss what the challenges are across in, in their respective states. And if I may just quickly summarize maybe a couple, two or three of those challenges. One is the fact that, um, and, and, I, and I mentioned this earlier, the yes. fact that um, citizens do not always have access. But beyond citizens, we also realize that even cops don't always have access to the laws that they purport to interpret. Mm-hmm. Legislatures, legisl- 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 legislators, uh, parliamentary, uh, uh, parliaments do not always have even access to the laws that they have passed or even to judgments that have, you know, placed particular, you know, put, interpreted those laws and, yes. and, and which would have affected the way that those lawmakers interact with either reforming the laws or amending the laws to make them consistent with the constitutional provisions and judicial interpretations in their country. So it, it's a huge problem, really. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not just a citizen's problem. It's also a problem that public agencies grapple with. And if I, if I may just give an example, um, um, there is a, um, the question of, 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 of a boundary dispute between Sierra Leone and, 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 uh, and Guinea, for instance. Yes. Um, and, and there's a bilateral instrument that, you know, at some point in time in the past, tried to demarcate that boundary. Mm. You know, but as if Sierra Leone doesn't have, that, doesn't have that, that instrument, it's only Guinea that has that instrument. So... Um, that could be a potential problem if, if both countries are able to resolve that uh, very um, maturely and amicably. That mm. could result to a, a real, a serious potential problem. And, and one, of, one of the outcomes, one of the revelations, one of the things, we, the insights we came to, to share, we got to share one of these workshops is that actually not being able to access information as and when proper um, could in fact raise serious national security problems, as in the case of the boundary dispute, for instance. Yeah. So it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. Now, secondly, uh, we realize also that governments are not paying the kind of attention that they need to pay um, to enabling access to information, facilitating access to information. Mm-hmm. Now, first and foremost, we must acknowledge that it's a primary responsibility of government to make legal information available to the citizens that they govern. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it goes without saying, what is the rule of law? I mean, how, how strong can compliance with the rule of law be? How effective can compliance with the rule of law be if citizens don't have access to those laws? If those laws are not effectively publicized, why do you publicize for citizens to know yeah. what their rights and obligations are? Mm. You know, so so these, are, these, are, these are some of the challenges that we grapple with across the region. Um, yes. Like you said, South Africa has 
has has shown um, in many ways has has given the lead um, in terms of uh, making legal information accessible. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are still challenges there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, challenges in terms of how to accessing. Uh, legislation, for instance. Yes, you I know, suspect um, that, th- uh, yeah. that this is also uh, the the start of a l- much longer process because there are other reforms that will will come about as a result of free access uh, and open justice. Because in administering justice, this forms part of um, you know the police have to be responsive in a particular way. Um, that investigations or forensics has to be responsive in a particular way. So these are some of the other consequences or other conversations that might come into the fray because uh, getting justice is dependent on so many other factors. Absolutely, absolutely. And and we do realize that uh, that there are many, many voices that need to come into this process. Mm -hmm. And and that's exactly what we're doing as we engage with with different, um, uh, not just within the legal community. We, We realize, one, we realize that we need to expand our engagement with the legal community. We also realize that we need to go beyond the legal community and begin to it, 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 it. You need access to legal information. Everybody needs access to info, legal information. Mm-hmm. So it, it's more about how, not just how, it, it's beyond how lawyers ingest the law or lawyers engage with the law or utilize the law. It, 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 the whole concept is to promote and hand, encourage citizens, ordinary Africans, ordinary South Africans to reach out, know what the law says about their rights and obligations, know what the law, how the law confines the path, uh, it, 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 it defines the path, the limits of public power, and to begin to engage meaningfully, intelligently with the law. So we actually want to put the law in the hands of the common man, mm-hmm. you know, uh, who may not always be able, able to afford the service of a lawyer, but knowing the law actually empowers him to engage meaningfully with, 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 with um, um, the public official, for instance. Yes, because I think this not only puts the spotlight on the judicial systems in different African countries, but also on other supporting institutions and how Absolutely, well resourced yeah. and how well supported they are by those governments. Has this been yeah. uh, one of the, the areas of concern? The institutions yes. on the ground that support the judicial process? Yes. Um, in terms of free access, law, we realize that... Um, the, the impediments are not just around perhaps lack of appreciation about the importance of free access to law. Mm. Um, beyond that, um, realize that also there are capacity challenges. Um, uh, and, and again, one of, what, one of the, the insights that we shared at the workshop is the fact that uh, the culture of managing information in our public institutions is very, very poor. Mm. You know, so um, that will need to be addressed very, as, a matter, as, as a very, very urgent uh, necessity. Um, but, but, but of course, like you have said, um, this is something that's going to um, happen over the long term. Um, it's not something that can be just um, done overnight. It, mm-hmm. it requires consistent engagement with um, the public institutions, um, convincing them to, make, uh, to manage their information more appropriately, to adopt proper standards for maintaining, for preserving, keeping you know, uh, and protecting legal information and also making that information available. So we, we work on quite a number of different fronts in terms of providing capacity to be able to uh, manage legal information. Uh, of course, that's to the extent to other forms of information. Yeah. Managing information effectively is, is very, very important. And then making that information available to uh, legal information institutes, for instance, just like such as African League and the Southern African Legal Information Institute, which we, uh, I also work with, um, to... Uh, republish that information and make it widely available to to citizens. Yes. Now, um, can we get details of the uh, uh, gathering that's happening in Johannesburg? Is it open? Who is it open to, firstly? Well, it's it's open to a wide range of 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 of, of stakeholders, um, um, courts, justice departments, uh, the legal profession, um, um, the academia. Mm-hmm. Um, um, publishers of law, um, non-profit and for-profit publishers of, of, of law, and quite a wide range, and of course to civil society as well. Um, uh, so we, to judicial administrators uh, and justice departments. So um, it's going to be as, it's as broad as possible. Um, I think okay. the, the, the key issue here is um, who has anything to do with the law mm-hmm. in a very meaningful sense? Who could um, stimulate, who could enhance the, the, the process of making the law accessible to, 
um, ordinary citizens. Right. And uh, what are the website details, Toya? Could you say that again? Uh, just contact details, website, where do we turn to? Well, um, now Africanly is uh, situated within um, the, the Democratic Governance and Rights Unit at the University of Cape Town. Um, the Democratic Governance and Rights Unit is an applied research center within the fa- law faculty. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, we, 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 our website is uh, www.dgru mm-hmm. at UCT. Yes. And the Africanly website is www.africanly as an A-F-R-I-C-A-N-L-I-I. Uh, dot org. Dot org. All right. So you can find information about DGRU and African League on, on, on that website. Of course, I mentioned the Southern African Legal Information um, Institute as well. It's www.safli.org. All right. So we'll, uh, yeah, we can be contacted through any one of this medium. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much, Toyin. Thank you for the call. Thank you. That's Dr. Olua Toyin Badejogbin, and he is a policy and uh, advocacy lead for the African Legal Information Institute. They want to see a situation where more ordinary citizens across the African continent have access to the law and encourage an open justice system. I mean, in South Africa, we've made amazing strides. In fact, I was looking at what um, uh, Justice Museneke had been talking about as far as some of the pitfalls are concerned um, and as some uh, as far as some of the uh, the advantages uh, are concerned when it comes to to open justice. So it is a terrain that uh, we have happily gone into, but we need to encourage our neighbours, of course, so that people have access to justice. And of course, this can be attained through open justice. Let's bring you headlines.